President, at the uh, recent IU7 meeting, we <coughs> did the following things. Approved and accepted the e-signature resolution, approved the Safe School Initiative Competitive Partner Agreement between the IU and the Pennsylvania Department of Education, accepted and approved the proposal for one-year extension for existing rates for the first student, incorporated to provide transportation for the next school year, approved and authorized the WIU to enter into a three-year lease with Jeanette City School District on the premises at the corner of Park Street and Washington Avenue, City of Jeanette, accepted retirement residations of several folks, ratified a re request of one classroom assistant for medical leave, <coughs> named Larry T. Lance the position of E-Academy Program and Application Support Analyst. This was an internal move. For James Desrica to the position of Assistant Business Manager. That was a new position. Approved the administration in his written contacts, contract with Diane Sternick and Sherry Boston <coughs> serves as registered nurses for this next school year. Approved the contract with James Somerville, Director of Human Resources and Management Services from July 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2019. That was a new five-year contract. Approved contract extension for the Executive Director from no November 1st, 2015 through August 1st, 2016. Also, uh, extension of existing contract. Approved addition to the Teacher and Classroom Assistance Long-Term Sublist for the 2013-14 school year and approved a resolution the agreement in a labor case. That's all I have for that report, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Dr. Trey, Libraries and Legislative Council. Thank you, Madam President. Just briefly, um, really the libraries, uh, the only issues pertained were discussions with each of the libraries related to the potential modification of uh, what we're providing as far as an allocation based upon uh, uh, a plan that may or may not involve uh, actual student participation. We were going to address that issue at some stage by, by uh, by May, and the libraries are aware that there could be a change at that time. Um, the second thing uh, goes to the Legislative Council. Um, the only areas I want to address is I want to acknowledge uh, Representative Dunbar. At, we you know, are, are very involved uh, and well thought out uh, building project. Uh, there are several problems in the issue, and one obviously is prevailing wage, and we're getting information on this this evening, and also we're getting uh, information on plan con, but uh, uh, Representative Dunbar has stepped, stuck his neck forward and is trying to develop some type of legislation in order to get this process moving again. You know, we're short almost $10 million in this process that could take a real, could really enhance what we're doing in the district because of the lack of availability of plan con and, and the abandonment of the state at this stage. And, and George has come to the forefront, is evolving a plan, trying to push it, trying to get his colleagues involved, co sign on the bill so that we can get some type of organized and fair plan and also get some help at some stage. So I'm just uh, throwing out at this particular time to acknowledge uh, his uh, contribution and, and appreciation. Uh, I'd also like to take an opportunity to, to uh, congratulate uh, our uh, solicitor, Mike Brungo. Uh, he has been, he, he, he and his firm, he specifically have been appointed to the uh, PSBA Advisory Council. Uh, they've reorganized the entire Pennsylvania School Boards Association process. I think you can see that with some of the information received. And uh, he has uh, taken the forefront as being uh, uh, the representative there as a part of the, the redesign and the focus and the proper legal guidance for our organization. So I congratulate you, Mike. And, <laughs> and as 
side note, this is not political, but but I had to mention this. I, I noticed that one of our uh, our media people in here uh, has received, uh, matter of fact, Chris received an award uh, for a Keystone Award just recently for doing an article raced, released upon <coughs> the uh, tracking of our superintendent through the process. So, uh, hey, Chris, you're up. You deserve a nice job. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Madam President. All right, thank you. Can I make a suggestion? Can we skip down to the information on the three, take care of those, and then back up the special reports? Works for me. I think it's a great idea. Sure. You're on. Jumping on there. We have we had a great season um, this past couple of months. A lot of great athletes to reward, and I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Hetrick. Thank you, Dr. Good <clears throat> It's my pleasure to come here tonight, as Dr. Harris <coughs> mentioned, and, and bring to all of you and to everybody here in the community tonight uh, something we all have to be very proud of, uh, a team and two individuals uh, who accomplished things that um, we could only hope for at the beginning of the year. But what a, what a great year we've had, and this past winter has gotten even better. And the first group I'd like, like to bring up is our girls basketball, our WPL champions. And I'd like to bring up Coach Giannikas and, and the girls and his staff. So come on up, guys. Uh, before I introduce the coaches, I just want to say uh, thanks for having us here tonight. Um, uh, honor to be here. And, you know, without, I've been talking with, with, through this whole run. We're all in this together. Without the support of you guys and like, the students up here and the parents support, how we wouldn't be here right now. And um, just want to say, before I introduce these guys, we have a better, couldn't have a better group of kids in and out of the classroom representing you guys here. So, uh, you know, it means a lot to bring the first championship here at Ben Trafford, and um, we'll do our best we can next year to compete again. And wouldn't mind being here again next year. So we'll try. But, uh, Introduce these guys. Uh, first, my staff: uh, Dave Moyle, Brian Allen, and Jamie Brim. And then the girls here. Uh, we'll start. Uh, there's four not, uh, four or five not here. Um, five. Uh, Dina Biondi couldn't make it. Um, Courtney Chatter couldn't make it. Rachel Kozaglo, Kelly Wisniewski, and Sarah Kasha. So uh, they were all part of our team here. And the kids that are here: um, Taylor Karen, uh, Jessica Deutsch. Michelle Bosco, Sam DeFazio. Congratulations. Thank you. Good job. Emma Ball. Congratulations. Katie, by the way, made an all section team to post the event. Maria Pallarino. Thank you. Maria made all section team of the Post Gazette and uh, first uh, first PT player ever make a state team. Second team all state. Uh, right there, first team. First player. Casey Young, all star team for the crib and post. And our only senior, Kayla Sushoka. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 Uh, and, uh, last, last but not least, it's Marie and Casey at a medal, uh, one for Dr. Harrison. Ironic. You know what? You guys don't have to come to school tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is, that is that include the teacher? No. <laughs> you got some ears to perk. You might be hard to absent, but. but. <laughs> I tell you, these girls were a fun group of girls to watch. As you know, we didn't, I don't think my husband and I missed many games at all. Certainly not past probably mid season or so. They were just a fun group of watch, a fun group of girls to be around. We're going to, we miss you until next. Um, you know what, they made the snow and everything that was going on so much better. Something to get for. It was amazing. Hey, not only the they won they won the championship, but I, I, I told these girls, and the whole, we had a sports uh, program uh, breakfast the other day, but not only did they win the championship within itself is a great feat, especially, you know, upsetting all those teams, but I thought it was just 
phenomenal the way that you girls brought this whole community together. I mean, at the Palumbo, we had how many people that showed up from Penn Trafford wearing their green and gold? And that was something special. And you don't get that kind of turnout typically uh, at some of these events with some other schools. And, and we do have that here. So it brought everybody together. It brought the student section together. The excitement and enthusiasm was wonderful. So thank you very much for that. It was awesome. And that Hemfield game, you didn't quit. That was great character. Uh, that was, that was great character. Well, I think all to the coaches and the kids and the parents. <coughs> all the way through, right? Because you guys weren't preseason choices. So that tells you what team working together can do. It's a great job. Great job. They left an impress over young Maria that you did in that. And that girl in the pimple. <laughs> Freaking that was, angles, right? That was, really, that was super. That brought everybody to their feet. That was super. I don't know if you guys ever seen the first player in basketball history for PT to make a state team. She made second team. Second state. team, yeah. I saw that. Yeah, well deserved and earned. So, yeah. We look forward to next year. Yes. Mm -hmm. we'll be back. Okay. Next is just to reiterate on what Mr. Ringley said. I mean, it, the, the way that that group brought the community together at the end was amazing. <laughs> Um, one of the sports websites said that Penn Trafford by far had the best student and support section at, down at the Plumbo Center. It was a great site. So next, I'm going to bring up a freshman that we have this is here. He is our 132-pound WPIL and PIAA state champion, <coughs> Mr. Cameron Coy. Introduce our coach, Mr. Rich Ginther. Rich, first, excuse my attire. I just ran up from the softball field. So. <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce Cam to you guys. Tell you a little about about his season. As Mr. Hattrick said, he's a freshman, and you know, wrestling in Pennsylvania is by far, you know, probably the toughest state in the country. And to win a state tournament as a senior, let alone as a freshman, is you know quite a feat. When he started the season off. He was in a weight class that had two returning state champs in it. One's a junior, one's a senior. Naturally, they're both from our section. So uh, he had the opportunity to wrestle those guys quite a few times through the season. And it was right there, and he, and he found out right away that he, he was right there at that, these guys' level already, losing some one-point matches. And talk about you know, peaking at the right time, come the WPL tournament, he wrestled uh, the returning state champ in the state finals and, you know, Really turned it on and gave it to him. I think one five to two. Really a very convincing win to win. Uh, become I think our sixth WPL champion in Penn Trafford, and then went to the state tournament. And uh, you know we got to thank you guys because you know, without you guys we wouldn't be able to make trips like that. And I told him I said, hey, the schedule's perfect. If you win, if you win on Thursday, you're done till Friday afternoon. If you win on Friday, you're done till Saturday morning. When I mean, you get to enjoy Hershey and get get to enjoy the whole experience and. He just started picking away at it. He was 15 years old wrestling 18 year old men, you know, that you know, look like men compared to him. But I don't know where he finds the strength, but he didn't give up a point until the finals. Uh, he ended up winning three to one, I think, in the finals. Two to one. That was the first point he gave up in the whole state tournament. He was late in the third period when he gave it up. So uh, just a great year. Look forward to a lot of big things from him. You know, naturally we'd hope he'd win more, but you know, like I said, winning one in this state's Phenomenal, so thanks for the opportunity, though. Okay, I have one last student here tonight. Um, she's another tough competitor, and I know she's even tougher now because when I was talking to her parents, I grew up 
and found out that they were from Braddock, just like I was. So, um, so now I'd like to bring up last our state bowling champion, uh, Miss Amanda Ballas. Amanda, come on up. Introduce our coach, Mr. Bud Cummins. Bud, go ahead. All right. First of all, I want to thank the athletic department and the school board for all the support you've given us over the years. I've been with the program for about 12 years now, and uh, it, this is our first uh, state champ. Uh, Amanda qualified for the states by being in the regionals, and she finished third in the regionals. She averaged 190 through the first six games of the championship round or the preliminary run and it put her in a step down she finished total she finished fourth total pins and then she had to beat four girls to win the state championship the semifinal ended up in a tie and they had a bowl of ninth and tenth goal and she won that so in the last game she won by two pins it was a pretty exciting experience so not only that in two years only being a sophomore she's in the top ten of total pins from the school for all time, and um, she has the highest single season average of any PT bowler before, and that's a 200.87. So she's pretty amazing, and uh, I think we can get two more years. Out. <laughs> um, no, it was here this year. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a nice Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Great job. Congratulations. 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 Hey, Matt, Matt, let me, I'm going to say something. Okay. Hey, Mr. Petrucci wants me to. Cameron, tell me if this story is not true. I heard it coming along that earlier in the year you got beat by the state champ or something like that. I think your dad suggested why don't we go down to weight class since you're a freshman, get some experience, see what things are going like, see how that works out for you before you move up to the weight class when you get a little older. Yeah. I think your answer was no, I want to beat the best. So that's. Part of it. That's a pretty cool <laughs> story. I got that from Mr. DiNapoli. And that's, uh, that's a great story there. So I just wanted to share that, Mr. Yeah, I shared it a couple weeks ago when you were going through the Whippeals. So. Thank you. Good job. And you're more than welcome to stay, but if I understand we have a long meeting. I don't think no one's ever stayed, so you won't offend any of us if you leave. So thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming. All right, we're going to jump up to um, career, oh, sorry, career, tech. career tech. All right, moving back to our normal agenda, um, career tech, Mr. Petrucci. Okay, thank you, Madam President. Um, the meeting was uh, March 19th. Uh, we interviewed three uh, companies for the fire security access intercom system. First one was Security System of America, SSA. Johnson Control was the second one, and Vector Security the third one. Um, the screening committee was uh, Tim Wilson, who's our technology coordinator, Scott Miller, who's head of our building and grounds, and Carl Scooty, the York School Director, who's been helping us go through this entire building process. Um, we are going to make our final decision at our April 16th meeting, who we're going to have for our new um, fire security system. John Cirk for Johnson recorded on the um, as I told you about the um, oil tank, under submerged oil tank, and the uh, renovations, we have to remove that. We're going to remove it. Uh, it's going to be, we got to find a better at $8,200. Um, remove it. We have to have the hole open. It'll be done after school is closed. The hole has to be open for two weeks. And after that two weeks, they do soil sample, air sample, and if there's any, any kind of moisture on there, a water sample to see if there are any contaminants left. If there are, then they got to dig deeper until it get, get everything completely dry and eliminate all contaminants. Now, we also had a report from SARP, same report we got here in the state, or came through very well. Um, the project is 75% complete. After school was out, 
The switch gear will be replaced and done by July 8th, and by that time I think all the renovations should be totally done. Uh, the goodie report are potato and macaroni salad, relish tray, vegetable tray, homemade sandwich rings with capicoli, provolone, ham, a variety of meat cheeses, and desserts for coconut cream pie, blackberry pie, lady locks, and a variety of cookies. And our next president, our next meeting is April 16th, Madam uh, Mr. President, I just have one more thing about the Career Tech Center. Um, three of our students um, were honored by the Alliance of Automotive Service Providers for their academic and technical achievements in our auto technology program. Ryan Pearson, Lester Falk, and Alex Boyd. I, I, I won't get that by March. I'm glad you got it now. That's that good. very impressive. I won't get it. That is impressive. Sorry, April 16th. That's good. That's good. That's, good. That's, good. That's, good. That's, good. That's all I'm going to All right. Thank you, Mr. Petrucci. Uh, Recreation Awards, um, Penn Township. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, our meeting was on March 27th. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about, uh, let's we'll start with phase one, uh, the completion of phase one for the uh, municipal park should be wrapped up uh, June 21st um, and that's still putting final touches on paving part of the walking trail and some benches that need to be installed uh, then we had some dialogue regarding phase two and uh, at the meeting the friends of PTARC were there to give a $10,000 donation to sort of kick off phase two project which includes uh, upground, upgrading of the existing playground equipment. Uh, Phil, how old do you think that current equipment is? At least 20 years. A uh, volleyball court, uh, basketball, tennis courts, uh, in addition to the, you know, obviously the current uh, uh, fields that we have there now. Um, that uh, grant is due from a paperwork perspective by April 16th, which they're on target to hand that in. And the total scope of project with work in kind and, and any donations that are made over the next couple years is $450,000. The project itself will take about over 18 months to complete once it uh, kicks off. Um, we spent some time then talking about uh, the relationship with baseball and uh, softball organization. Uh, just in terms of where they're at this year, they have 650 players that are signed up. They just gave us some milestones for their uh, uh, season. Talked a little bit about uh, the triathlon, which is a run, bike, run this year, obviously because we're going on at the high school. And uh, baseball is not scheduling uh, uh, activity, baseball and softball night, scheduling activity that day. We then also talked about uh, a park coordinator position. I guess they had advertised it once and got zero interest. So uh, I told them I'd bring it up at this meeting. Basically, the responsibilities for the park coordinator, which we paid $9 an hour, and it's basically a May through September job every year, um, would be including, but not limited to, monitoring the park uh, uh, for safe conditions and, and overseeing the pavilion rentals, uh, monitoring the organization use of parks, coordinating the fall festival, and uh, the use of the park in general. Um, so, we're asking that uh, the papers once again sort of make note of it so that they're looking for some candidates they've, like I said, the first time around they got zero, so. Um, we then also talked about our, our geese issue that we have down there. Uh, there's <laughs> multiple, uh, multiple problems that obviously having that many geese present other than cleanliness, uh, attacking the kids and uh, just the overall dirtiness of the, the animal itself, but they're also looking to expand in that area of the park, which uh, could cause some problems because uh, the volleyball court, basketball court, and tennis courts are proposed to be over there by the pond. So they're dealing with all kinds of ways of trying to manage it. And I think actually in the next meeting, Phil, we have somebody actually come in to do a little presentation or some, something going on that they're uh, throwing out. We'll have some answers. Yeah. So uh, that's about the extent of uh, uh, meeting was rather interesting though because of uh, uh, phase two and excitement around uh, enhancing the park for the community as well as uh, what was happening in phase one. So it'll be all men, President. All right, thank you, Dr. Koshko. All right, Trafford. Thank you, Madam President. As far as your geese go, Mr. Dr. Koshko, uh, Mr. Leonard gave me some repellent. 
that they used before, and um, we it did work for a little while. Then after a while, they sort of got conditioned to it. Does you mean for their eggs or for yeah, which? For which just just what was it, Mr. Leonard? It's just uh, generally the uh, unpleasant situation, not 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 for eggs or anything. No, just uh, to keep okay. them because we've been talking about all kinds of things. I tell you, lots of luck to you. It's, uh, they get the young ones around there really defensive. You guys. Yes. Concern. Yeah, it, it, nice. that and open feeding of the ducks. Oh, that's, that's, that's what happens. People feed them, and they just uh, the they think they they're will They said if you're feeding them, they will not leave. Doesn't matter if if you do all kinds of preventative stuff. As long as you're feeding them, they won't leave. No yeah, problem. that is absolutely true. So they talked about how they could monitor that, um, and didn't come up with a good answer because. Uh, Quite frankly, there's signs posted now already, and they're still feeding them openly. Right. I mean, I've that seen people feed them. So. That is, I just want lots of luck. You guys, yep. if you find a solution, please let me know. Okay, we met on the um, last Monday, March 31st. Um, Easter Easter uh, program is this uh, Saturday at uh, 12 o'clock. Um, so it's that Easter bunny there, all kind of goodies for the kids. Um, Don's Pizzas puts his donating a pizza for all the kids. We have 100, over 100 kids signed up so far. Um, there's also that, that Easter egg hunt down in BY. Um, we also went because the, the terrorist playground now is getting more young couples in there with young children. We decided to expand the program to the terrorist playground, but the um, council said they only had one more director for the playground, so the the um, uh, recreation board is going to pay for the other. Uh, Playground director, then we're going to um, expend our salary also to 850 an hour, and I think we're going to pick that up also, extra 50 cents an hour. Um, this is all benefit of the auction, which is spreading out pretty good. Um, Mike Ginsburg came down, friends of PTARC, gave a $2,500 check to the council <laughs> for the um, um, new Westmoreland Park. It's going to be up done up right across from the middle school. Seniors, the senior citizens, so we reach all age groups in Trafford. The senior citizens will now, I think it's the first two Thursdays in May, we'll go to the uh, theater factory, and the um, rec board is going to pay, the price is $13 a ticket, the rec board is going to pay for half, $6.50. We're gonna, so we're going to be a um, K to 80 group, I guess, and it, to help out all the different age groups. and uh, so. Because we had a few senior citizens that all you do is take care of the young kids, so it's going to be extended out to the uh, senior citizens also. Um, let me see what else did I mentioned. Our next meeting, um, we, we discussed the first third, first Saturday in uh, June will be the um, uh, fishing derby. That's all, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Petrucci. Ken Barrow. Uh, there's no report, Madam President. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Trey. That it brings it to me, P. Tark. All right, the um, general account balance um, it, at this point um, is ninety-five thousand five hundred. Last year, at the same point, it was eighty-seven thousand. So, P. Tark as a whole is much more solvent, much more than it was four or five years ago when I first got on this board when they were trying to figure out how we were going to make the um, bills um, at the end of the year so that's good news um, starting in May we're going to have an intern from Cal U who's going to be with us for 12 weeks she'll be working 40 hours a week and it's of no cost to the district um, some news from Manor um, Joy Klontz I think that's how she pronounces her name is going to be the PTARC representative from Manor um, on a more negative note um, Manor has decided to withdraw from PTARC um, the effective date will be January 1st, 2016, and that has to do with how the contract is set up. Um, beginning May 1st, Cheryl will go off of our insurance. She had asked for a monthly reimbursement for not using our insurance of $490. We've agreed to $250 a month. Um, on April 25th is the dad and daughter night out. If anybody wants information on that, I have it. Um, registration year to date is 980. Last year at this time is 915. Cheryl had actually commented that it seems with the bad weather more people are signing up for classes. Okay, um, the Chili Golf Classic, which was at the end of March, raised $1,200. 
There's going to be a car cruise on May 4th, and um, I have information on that. Um, facility rentals. March was the single busiest month they have had at the um, Shelley Proskin rent, um, Rec Center. Um, but for 2014 so far, they've had 44. At this point through 2013, they had 31. And my last thing is the triathlon is June 21st. So if you have any interest in that, I also have a flyer on that. And that is all I have. Just a real quick one on triathlon. Mr. Kerry, we have been mentioned school renovations. I guess it, that uh, Cheryl's kept in touch with you to work around the uh, facility here. Uh, everything's out because we don't, construction wasn't going to start to July 1, I, I assume. To, they can still have the triathlon. Well, they're working that out. They're doing it across the street. Yeah, yeah I don't think they can change it at this point. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. That's why I was saying the base here. No pool? She mentioned about the pool, didn't she? It's like run, bike, run. Okay. All right. I thought the pool was just run. Yeah, they call something different. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, Mayor President. Dr. Harris. Community Education Foundation. Um, today, the foundation awarded grants to several teachers throughout the school district. The grants totaled twenty thousand and five dollars. <laughs> Brent donated the five. <laughs> Two of the grants that were awarded um, dealt with the district's push on implementing more STEM activities. The I Tech department received $6,516 to purchase two 3D printers for the middle school and the high school tech classes. The students in these classes were able to make an invention and create a prototype to determine real life functionality. John Milovac from Penn Middle received $4,952 grant to purchase hands on STEM equipment to cover the topics of motion, force, weather, and general science. In addition to $20,000, the foundation also awarded Trafford, McCullough, Sunrise, and Level Green $5,000 each of earned income tax money to purchase the items they need to produce math rooms similar to that of Harrison Park. Since Harrison Park already has um, the math room, we also awarded them $1,000 um, as well to expand their room. So now that all schools are going to have a math resource room. A lot of work, and um, today was a lot of fun <laughs> walking around giving off the checks. Phil was on the board with us, and it's hard, but we had to look at all the apps. We had about 32 applications, and this year we decided to word bigger um, ticket items so we didn't get to get everyone um, awarded, but there was a lot of good ideas. Do you have any comments? Or? No, it was just uh, very exciting to be involved uh, in the whole process uh, to, to see um, the hard work of the foundation. There, there's, there's been board members on there. Uh, probably just a handful from the very beginning of, of the foundation that Dr. Colony started, but you're, you're seeing the benefits of, of this program now after all these years. Look at the numbers and uh, the money's going directly back into this uh, school district because it's very impressive. And to be able to, to, to give that type of money, this size dollar amounts, and really affect every you know a, a lot more children, it's just it's a very exciting time to be involved. Anybody interested, we're always looking for uh, new board members. And contact Dr. Harris or myself or uh, willing to, to take any and all. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Um, we do not have a need to meet for an executive session. I do apologize for us being a little um, bit late <coughs> at the beginning. We did uh, meet prior to the, um, tonight's meeting. We received some legal advice. We discussed negotiations with the PTEA and received information only on um, upcoming meeting schedules, calendars, read 180. We also discussed various personnel matters, including discipline issues, and we discussed the confidential student matter. Okay. Now, moving on to the information sure. section. Thank you, um, this is kissing. The first three we covered was Carrie, so we're gonna move on to number four. Sarp and Company's audit report. I'm going to direct to take over. Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, John Sarp, the managing partner of Sarp and Company. He's been here before, so you may remember him. And with him tonight is Max Fontaine, who actually performed the audit work this year. I have to warn you, Max is very talkative, so he's been here a while. So. But uh, Max, I turn the floor over to you. Yeah. Um, I think Brett passed out the uh, audit report and a uh, letter of uh, communication with those in charge of governance. Um, I'll just briefly briefly go over those with you. Um, if you turn to page 53 in the audit report, 
uh, you'll find the, our schedule of findings and question costs. And this is basically a sum summary of the results of our audit. Uh, you'll note that the type of auditor's report that we issued was an unmodified report. That uh, is the same as we issued last year. It's the um, last year we issued an unqualified report. The wording changed. Uh, professional standards required us to change the wording. Um, but it's the best type of report that you can receive, so it's, everything was good with that. And uh, if you'll turn to page uh, one in the report, uh, that is our independent auditor's report, and you'll notice that the format changed a little bit from last year. Uh, just um, outlines management's responsibilities, um, our responsibilities as the auditors, uh, and then it gives our uh, opinion of the financial statements. And as I said before, the, uh, it is an unmodified opinion and that's the best that you can receive. Um, keep going uh, down on page 53. Uh, there were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies that were identified. And our report on um, page 48, which is a report on the internal control of the financial um, basic financial statements, that uh, covers, uh, covers uh, that part of the audit. Um, and there, were no, uh, there was no non-compliance uh, material to the financial statements noted. So, um, in regards to the federal awards, uh, we did perform a single audit. And uh, again, we issued an unmodified report. And there were no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies found. Uh, while performing that, the um, the report uh, on internal control regarding the federal uh, federal awards can be found on page 50, and that's um, basically the same thing as uh, the other report, just on the federal awards. Um, and you can uh, see below that the major programs that were audited in the single audit were uh, Title One and the special education grants, uh, otherwise known as uh, IDEA. So, and uh, then if you look at the letter that was passed out with the audit report, again, that was the letter that we, uh, that uh, professional standards require us to issue to those charged with governance. Um, just a couple things to go over with that. Um, if you look to, on the second page, you'll see that uh, there's a, um, item noted as difficulties encountered in performing the audit. Um, we didn't, we did not encounter any difficulties uh, performing the audit. Uh, Brett's, Brett and his staff were very helpful and cooperative with us, um, and we didn't note um, any disagreements between us with um, accounting principles that were used uh, through 2012-2013. On page three of that letter, you'll see that there's a section, uh, recent, recent accounting pronouncements. Uh, there's gonna be two new uh, GASB statements, uh, GASB 65 and GASB 68, that will be implemented uh, next audit uh, period. Um, GASB 65 uh, just properly classifies certain items that were previously reported as assets and liabilities. Um, as deferred outflows of resources and deferred inflows of resources. And uh, it'll just require a restatement of the beginning that position and uh, require a disclosure regarding the restatement and its effect. And uh, since I just went over that, we were, uh, it was required by professional standards that we change the statement of net assets to statement of net position this year. So it's, it's just a, uh, Different terminology, it's the same, it's the same thing, but uh, different terminology. Uh, and uh, GASB 68 uh, establishes standards of financial reporting for defined benefit pension plans and defined contribution pension plans. And um, again, there will just be uh, additional disclosures regarding significant assumptions and other inputs used to measure the total pension contribution as well as other disclosures regarding elements of the pension plan's base, basic financial statements. Um, again, just to reiterate that uh, everything went well with the audit, it was very smooth. Um, 
and no disagreements between Brett and us on anything. And uh, I'd just like to thank you for the, allowing us to perform the audit this past year and allowing me to present the report to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of Max? Okay, thanks Matt, we'll have a new agenda for next month. John, nice to see you again. Nice to see you too after a long time. <laughs> <laughs> right, next on the um, information. Under taxes and census, you will receive information regarding the LERDA, the Local Economic Development Tax Assistance. The creation of the LERDA would grant prospective developers or existing, existing business, I'm sorry, businesses that expand a three-year exemption of real estate and school taxes for new construction or addition, whichever the case may be. After a three-year period is up, the taxes will be assessed at their full value as usual. The Township Commissioner's take on this issue is that it's better to entice a business to build or expand a Penn Township and forgo three years of taxes as opposed to the business going elsewhere. And Mike, did you want to provide us more information about the LERTA? Sure. Um, LERTA is a uh, program and there are uh, several different uh, types of LERTAs, but the LERTA that's being proposed is a program where a, an area is uh, designated as a, a blighted area essentially and the uh, taxes that are being paid on the property as it currently exists, uh, the, the property itself and any uh, uh, buildings that may be on it, uh, if there is a current assessment, they continue to pay tax on that current assessed value. If there are any um, improvements, uh, new uh, construction, uh, additions, whatever the case may be, renovations, if it's the <coughs> taxes that are generated based on the higher appraisal, the new value, that are then exempt under this plan. So it's not like taxes are being forgiven that are already being paid. What's happening is that for the next several years, I, I think it's three years under this plan, the taxes, the new taxes, are being forgiven as an incentive to get somebody to come in, develop the property, renovate, uh, build new buildings, and so that at the conclusion of the three-year period, once the construction is completed, they have that exemption on the new taxes <coughs> that are owed, and then from that point forward, they're paying on a higher value. So the assessed value of that property rises <coughs> and they then in the fourth year pay the extra taxes moving forward. It's a way of, <coughs> it's a way that municipalities, counties and school districts uh, have used um, an incentive to um, attract um, developers to come in and to take an area that has been designated as blighted and make it um, viable again. And, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that, you know, you see, um, we, we did a number of LERTAs uh, in the Uniontown area to try and revitalize, uh, especially the downtown area, uh, whenever the steel industry left uh, Uniontown, and it, it helped, uh, you know, quite a bit. So that's typically the program of what a LERTA is. It's different, you may have heard of a TIF, a tax incremental financing. That's not what we're talking about here. That's something that was done, if you're familiar with the, uh, uh, the waterworks in Homestead, uh, that was a, a tax incremental financing program uh, where essentially the municipality, the school district, uh, the county, all kind of kicked in to produce the, um, uh, the infrastructure, uh, the roads, the, the sewage, sewage, water, electric, or whatever, to entice developers to come in because they then wouldn't have that expense. And that's, that's a different issue. But the LERTA is very common, and we've seen that uh, you know, throughout the years in a number of different areas. Dallas, you have any information? I do. I have a couple things I'd like to add. <clears throat> um, the current uh, proposal before the Penn Township Commissioners right now is not just a three year, it's a three year full, full right. 100%. Fourth year, 50%, fifth year, 25%. Yeah. That is the current draft that's being considered and seems to have a fairly good acceptance at the commissioner's level. This um, program has been developed in an effort to um, help to encourage businesses. It's, it's for business only. It's not, it's not for residential development. It's for business only, commercial development only. And it's in only specific areas. The, the specific areas will be defined and are defined in the current draft in front of the commissioners now. 
where this would apply. It would not be a blanket throughout the, the community. It would be in those specific areas. And as in response to the many meetings that the Penn Township Community Development Director and the Penn Township Department, Community Development Department have had in discussion with many folks that wanted to come in, wanted to do some commercial developments in the community and could never answer affirmatively, there's always three or four different issues that always come up. One was there's, there's not enough zoning to do those type of commercial developments. That's being adjusted right now. The uh, commissioners are working on a new zoning scheme. And uh, I, won't, I won't get into all the details, but the lure of the tax issue always come up with, is there any way that, you, that the, the community would consider some tax abatement to soften our ramp up costs as we bring our uh, business in your community? And that was never an affirmative answer. So this is uh, uh, projected to be an affirmative answer that would take the cooperation of all three taxing entities. The school district being the largest of the three, uh, the county being uh, second, and the uh, Penn uh, Township Commissioner in this case being the third. We've had discussions with the uh, Community Economic Development Department with the county, and they're, um, they and with, uh, actually with some uh, commissioner's uh, input, that they are on board if the school district and the local governing body approves this, this type of a tax arrangement, they would go through it to all, all participating parties expected to approve it and I believe that there's a uh, consensus on the other two entities and I would be certainly hoping that I myself I'm I am certainly think this is a good thing to do I'm hoping that our board as nine board members could come to some type of a consensus publicly to at least say it's a concept we can move forward with but we can only do that in concert with commissioners they would actually draft and approve the ordinance which is in draft form and they there's a time constraint that's really necessary because there's a couple of projects pending right now that this will probably be the um, the single factor that will help bring those projects in, into the community very quickly. And, uh, <coughs> yes. I just want to say I was on the board in the 80s and uh, right now alert is out to new terminology. And we were approached as a board uh, for a three-year tax exoneration and uh, we're out there now by the melon plan, which is right before Joe Spaghetti House. You'll see the industrial parks out there. We granted it unanimously that, that the board at that time, and it worked perfectly. It's still there. Why it ceased operation from then till now, I really don't know, but um, it was very beneficial. It'd be, it definitely behooves us to take full advantage of this. Well, in partial response to that, that Lord is still, in, is still existing. I pulled the I, I pulled the draft copies. I had some discussions with the Penn Township solicitor. That lord is proposed to be this this lord will be an extension of that lord, okay. and they, they can only go for ten years. As and I, anything I say that's it, it, uh, legally incorrect, our solicitor could correct me. But um, the maximum time you can have is ten years. That that one was proposed in the late '80s, and it it built it through that effort. It built that park out in a worked, decade. Worked very well. And it's probably our, our solidest single um, as re regards the tax base and job creation entity in the township right now. I just don't know why they continue, but it's a win-win situation. It's definitely after to in my first Any other comments, questions? Did, did you want to approve that now, Mr. Leonard, or do you want to wait till I, I think the, the township commissioners are looking for some consensus from this board that would at least give them uh, knowledge to believe <coughs> that it's something that if they move forward, they would, they would be uh, getting a, a concurrence yeah, from this board. And if, and if I may, this board would have to pass formal resolution, but you can't do that until the ordinance has been adopted by uh, the township. So once they've done that, certainly, uh, you know, you can uh, take action uh, to, uh, to pass a resolution uh, to uh, participate in that program. All right, any, other, <coughs> any other comments, questions? I have a comment. In light of that statement, I myself would, would step forward and say I'm in favor. Is there any, is there any board member who does not see this concept as a, as a worthwhile concept to move forward with it? Would there anybody have an objection or concern that I can I can help address? So are we asking for Matt to go back and let the commissioners know, or are we? That's what I was just going to say. If I mean, is, does anybody object to Matt going back to the commissioners and telling them that we would support? Or approve the um, Lorida program? Is there any objections? 
Okay. I would like to see some letter of that sort put forth from Madness. I think. Right. Uh, I hear any objection from the board. I think that's yeah. something and, that we. And, and if I may, um, th so then this board is directing the, the superintendent simply to inform the uh, the township that this board is willing to consider and to ultimately uh, uh, pass a resolution that will support the ordinance once the ordinance is in place. But you will have to you know, take official action. Right, we understand that. That's but, fine. But we have to wait for the township. But we're saying we will support it on our behalf. We we would support it. And Matt's going to And Matt's going to relay it to the um, to commissioners. Very good. All right, great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, fellow board members. We appreciate the support. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk about prevailing wages right now. I know the district is trying hard to do this um, building project and we're studying all the costs and we're looking at all our alternatives. But one of our biggest concerns right now is the amount of money that prevailing wages is costing us during our renovation project. And I'm going to ask Mike just to speak about prevailing wages. I think this is the most I've talked in meetings. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's leaving here. Yeah, the, the prevailing wage uh, law went into effect in 1961. So it's been around for quite some time, and the primary purpose of the law was to protect uh, state workers from um, uh, workers coming in from outside of the state uh, and, and taking over jobs on various construction projects. Uh, the law requires uh, public uh, projects, such as building projects and um, uh, improvements, renovations, things of that nature, things other than what they consider maintenance. Uh, any, any project done by a public agency such as a school district that exceeds $25,000 has to have the prevailing wage as part of the contract. It's the obligation of the entity, the school district, to um, uh, find out from the uh, Secretary of Labor what the prevailing wage would be for the region that you're in at that particular time. And the, the prevailing wage then that is provided to uh, the, the public entity has to be incorporated into the contract as stated. Now it's the obligation of the contractor or the subcontractor to be certain that they pay the prevailing wage to their employees. Um, and in fact, um, you as, an, uh, as a school district have, would have an obligation to verify, you know, the information that they provide to you, and to report uh, any non-compliance if it were to occur. But um, uh, you know, um, that's in very general terms the requirement of the Pre Prevailing Wage Act. And um, you know, there's there's no way that you uh, at this stage of the game can get around it. I understand that there uh, have been discussions about you know, uh, increasing that $25,000 amount. I mean, that's been around since 1961. So you can only imagine what it may, would be in today's dollars. But um, uh, that's, that's pretty much, you know, what prevailing wage is and why it's a consideration anytime you do any construction renovation or anything of that nature that's significant. Hank, how much is prevailing wages going to cost us in our project? And they we, um, we asked your construction manager to provide an estimate for that. And what they've come up with is, their rough numbers say that there was approximately, on a project your size, an additional $3 million in labor costs above and beyond what it would be to pay labor at a non-prevailing wage rate. And when you look at that $3 million, I know we're looking at a forward and out. That's definitely the difference. Yes, Scott has that information as well. That you want to We'll be asking the board to pass a resolution next week that we uh, support legislation that would increase that, that threshold uh, of $25,000 and to make adjustments uh, for the actual wage to be more in line with what uh, the local cost of, of, of the wages are in this area. Um, you know, the construction, prevailing wage is, is about 10% of your construction cost. And uh, over the last 10 years, um, there have been seven billion dollars in reimbursable school construction and if you take a look at 10% of that uh, it comes out to about 700 million dollars taxpayers have spent just on prevailing wages and, and as you know in our project it's about 32 million dollars so 10% would be about 3.2 million dollars which is what our construction manager has indicated so 
$3.2 million can go a long way in this district. And, um, you know, if there's any kind of changes we can help to, to make in that prevailing wage legislation, um, I think the board is uh, willing to do that. So we're asking the board to pass a resolution uh, next week to support that legislation. Does anybody have any questions? Um, the medical refund, um, we received a refund of the amount of $473,197 from the Westmoreland County Public School Health Consortium that would go to our fund balance. Um, approximately, well actually approximately 5% of that goes back to the employees in the um, form of a rate holiday because that's how much their contribution was. We received the refund balance because the money that was paid into the consortium was more than what was paid out of the consortium. Brett, did they set the rates for next year, or is that still under works? No, they're going to set the rates at their April meeting. They did at the March meeting pass a motion that would limit the rate increase to 5.1%. So it can't be any higher than that. I'm anticipating it'll probably come in a little lower than that, uh, as long as the trend continues as it has uh, for the school years up to date. So we'll see what happens, but we'll know next month or this month, the end of this month. So right. what would that increase likely be? Two hundred fifty thousand? Is that correct? In our case, it would be approximately two hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? Brett, how often uh, in the last five years have we received a refund? I think we had one rate holiday three or four years ago where we just didn't pay one month's uh, invoice, and. That's the only, there was one prior to that, prior to five years ago, but that's the only other time in the last five years. So other than the, is their balance just got so high they had to, had to do a refund to everybody? Is that, is that what sort of triggered it? Their balance, their fund balance got to the point where they felt they could safely release funds back to the districts because the reserves were great enough to cover any potential. Any outstanding? Yes. Yeah, because I don't remember getting a refund uh, since I've been on here. I know we did have a rate. Yeah, one one rate holiday. Yeah. Well, what I don't understand um, is we're getting a refund of $473,000, and then they're talking about increasing our rates by $250,000. Why, why give the refund? I ask that all the time. I, you know, whenever this topic comes up about a possible refund or a possible rate holiday, you know, it's always been the position of Penn Trafford that I take to the consortium <coughs> that we should just plow that money back into the rate, keep the rates down. Uh, however, I am unsuccessful, and sometimes the only vote in the room that uh, that feels that way. Okay. I was told the actuary that way it makes their makes their financing reports much easier. Does anyone have any questions about us putting it in the fund balance? All right, um, Plan Con, Dr. Trey actually talked about the meetings um, and George Dunbar, in, involved, George Dunbar's involvement with Plan Con, and he's trying to get a memo to overhaul Plan Con and provide reimbursement. He met with Brett and I and kind of oh. talked about the same issues. Um, although we're not guaranteed the money right now, we're still going through the Plan Con stage, and tonight there are two different items we're going to have to approve for Plan Con, even though, like, it's not guaranteed, but we still have to go through the approvals. Hank, do you want to describe the two that we're approving tonight? The, the two that you're approving tonight is your... Oh, not tonight, I'm sorry, for next week. Yeah. Oh, it's just for next week. You're, you're reading into um, you're reading into the minutes the, the exact wording that the state is giving back on the 20-year variance. That, the good news there is they've agreed <coughs> that, that you are eligible for approval of the 20-year variance on, on the reimbursement levels. All that's left to do is is act on that exact wording from the state and, and that will be approved. And the other thing you were doing is authorizing us to to submit the plan con part F because <coughs> your part your part D letter has come in and your part E letter is it was only pending that D approval. So both of those are approved. So the next stage is the F. Thank you. Hank. I have a comment regarding the I want to make a clarification that this board is, has been, and continues to make every effort to stay proposition caution that planning and removal of the projects from the plan 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 money does not That's fair state. Yeah, because we never want to pretend to lose any money. We're doing all the procedures, and Hank has actually kept us up to date on everything. 
and that's ongoing with the what we're going to do tonight we're going to make sure that we're staying continually positioned properly moving forward that should this plan con money become more available that we would be in a proper position to regret whatever we would with any projects we're working on now yes and those are items under a four and five under budget and finance thank you yes. and we also do we talk to our legislators we talk to people i i just talked to george dunbar 10 days ago you know we need something here come on this is important so and he's on our side he understands but We'll see. On um, this evening, we have a bond presentation, and when I'm ready to take over. Okay, with us again tonight are our bond team, Tony Massetti from PNC and Chris Brewer from Dinsmore Shoal. Uh, the board had asked that uh, they update us on the current status of the market, and if we stay with our $32 million mm -hmm. project, what that looks like. And we also asked Tony to put together a scenario if we extended the payback period to 20 years, what additional funds that could generate. So with that, Tony, I'll turn the floor over to you and Chris. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. way to explain the front of the book is actually to go to the second section of the book or the last section of the book beginning on page five and that's where the market update will come into play quickly and the best way to summarize what's been happening in the market is really twofold uh, number one is our own economy you've heard chris and i address the situation with the bond markets over the course of the past uh, two to three years as it, as it has really revolved around the bond market, the municipal bond market is smiling when the market is down, when the unemployment is high, when markets are struggling. That's what's driving interest rates lower. Over the course of coming out of the recession, we're still kind of grinding at it. And what we're really seeing now is, have we taken a solid foothold in this recovery? And that's what the market is really trying to decide. And what's really kept rates low has been the governmental intervention, basically forcing rates to stay low, especially in the short term, uh, really within the first five years. But that subsequently has kind of kept rates suppressed 10 years, uh, really 10 to 15 years out. Uh, has kept them somewhat subdued. And you've heard a lot of talk, especially uh, we've gotten a new Fed chair with uh, Janet Yellen, and as you've heard her speak, they've wanted to begin to pull back on their support of rates and keeping rates low. So you started to see things tick up, and we really saw that last June when Ben Bernanke was still Fed chair he kind of spoke and maybe people are still trying to decide did he speak out of turn or did he really make that misstep intentionally because what we saw were not only rates increase but we saw the yield curve steepen but ever since then and, and that'll be reflected on page six we've seen rates start to come back more towards where they were last summer uh, right around the time that, that mr bernanke spoke Another huge driver of that, as I said, it's kind of twofold. Another huge driver of that is the geopolitical scene. And basically, when you see unrest around the globe, the US investments tend to be known as safe harbors. They, it, it's called a flight to quality. And you'll see the US Treasury rates really start to fall when there's unrest around the world, whether it's geopolitically based, whether it's ec world economics, uh, if we see struggling economies, and what we've seen is kind of a combination of all of that. We've seen emerging markets 
not performing to where people had predicted, uh, whether that be <coughs> in, the, in the Pacific side uh, or down in the South American range. Uh, we've seen these emerging markets really try, they're, they're struggling at getting to the pace that everyone had predicted them to be at. The European market, some still battling a little bit of recession, some battling unemployment. Truly the German economy has, has kind of bolstered everything to some degree, but still not to the levels uh, of anticipation. And then you obviously have the Ukrainian situation with Russia. And everybody with a little bit of unrest, we see the dollars flow into the US markets. So with that being said, you can see where that's happened on page five, especially the upper chart, which is rates over the past 52 weeks. And you can see where the spike occurred back in June, raced up, continued to race up, and approach, and again, this is a, a, an interest, tax exempt interest rate proxy for 20 years. You can see that it's, it went up to the 5% level. And since then, it's come down, it leveled off, there's some in, uh, intra-week, intra-month volatility. But when it's all said and done, we're back down slightly below what's been the 52-week average in that index, which again serves as more of a proxy rate for tax-exempt rates uh, across the United States. And highlighted in yellow is where the 2013 bond issue occurred. So again, rates higher than the all-time lows, but they were certainly below that that spike, that, that peak that occurred in the summertime last year. Now with that being said, if you flip to page six, and really the graph on the left side shows that spike again compared tax exempt rates versus the US Treasury rates. And that's a, uh, basically utilizes the 10 year rate on both and how they track one another. And you can see in the red line tax exempt rates spiked quickly in June because of Ben Bernanke's speech. But since then, the markets took, took over again and decided, look, we're not convinced that all this has taken this immediate foothold and that the recovery is at the pace you, you may think it is. We think it might be a little bit behind. So that basically has been driving, keeping rates lower. And <coughs> what we also saw, again, we'll flip to that on page seven in a moment, but what we saw were people that were convinced that I don't want to be in fixed income anymore because rates are rising. I don't want to be locked in at a low rate today when it's going to be a percent higher, 2% higher tomorrow, 3% higher in, in six months. I don't want to lock myself and spend my cash today in an investment. I want to wait. And with what's happened is people have saw a little spike up, unsure about the economic recovery being full bore just yet. And they said, you know what? I didn't like the low levels. I didn't buy in at the high levels, but I like where levels are now. And what we've started to see our investors come back into the fixed income market. And, and you'll see, we'll talk about that in a moment on page seven. But just to mention, the graph to the right that, that's labeled yield curve slope, as I stated based on page, uh, <coughs> we mentioned on page five, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that rates spiked up and then have come back to where they were last summer. That's kind of evidenced there by the dark blue line that's marked by uh, the green triangles there that kind of uh, bolds itself against the other lines. The orange colored line was where rates were on June 19th last summer. A little more steepness in the front end of the curve, rates a little bit higher in the front end of the curve, but as you can see versus the red, green, and purple lines that occurred last summer through last fall into, into the beginning of winter, rates have truly started to come back to where they were last summer. And again, how long is that gonna last? We can't predict. But what we can see is what's causing that. And what a big mover besides the geopolitical, besides the US economy trying to get a little stronger foothold in recovery, if you flip to page seven, demand directly affects price. And in this graph uh, that, that we bring to the district, and it is really a telltale sign, as money is flowing out of fixed income, the rates are going up. 
And that's evidenced by all the red bars. That's the periods of time when investors are drawing their money out of bond funds, bond investors are walking away and putting their money in equities or other asset classes. When it's blue, the positive bars, that's when money is flowing in to the fixed income, uh, mutual funds uh, and the like. That's what we're tracking here. And as you can see, late uh, after late turn of the year and into 2014, we saw all these negative outflows of cash. Investors started seeing that. I'm not seeing this quick run up in equities. I'm not seeing it in other asset classes. So maybe I want to go back into some of the fixed income. Rates are higher than they were. I'm not buying in at all time lows but I went back in. And so as you see this positive inflow back into, into fixed income funds, we watched rates stay lower or maintain some consistency as to where they were. And that's what we're seeing today is that rates are still maintaining that momentum of, of being, you know, on a historical basis low. Uh, are they as low as the all time lows? No, we are off of those. Probably not to see those for any time soon, you know, barring any type of economic collapse again. But, and, and I don't think anybody really wants that. But what we have seen is a consistent demand now for tax exempt fixed rate investments. And, and what's benefiting that, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the beneficiaries of that uh, are certainly anyone going out looking, uh, looking to borrow money at this point or re refinance eligible debt. And we're still seeing that occur straight through the beginning of 2014 here uh, as we're heading into spring. Now with that being said, if we flip back to the front of the book, what we've done is, again, these are, the first option is reflecting where does it sit today, just completing the district's project, maintaining an issuance of total bonds, incorporating the 2012, the 2013, and the pending issue. Uh, for completion, maintaining the $32 million max issuance. And the projects, again, working with Hack and Per, the, the plan con docs, the total project right now, a, a shade under $31 million. So can we finance that project with all the other, um, uh, so, you know, all, all, every other component of the financing under $32 million? And as you can maintain the desired term, and maintain the district's existing annual debt service requirement. And as you can see here, the estimated completion with funds on hand and to reach the $31 million project, the district would issue about $12.4 million more, 12360 right now, uh, again, given where rates are as of today. And that project would take you out and basically shown by the dark navy bars would be the completion bonds. The two lighter shades of blue represent the 12 and the 13 already being in place. And the room, the way that the first two bonds were structured allowed for the room to place the completion bonds and back basically fill all the way up to where you're at now with your current debt service level. The back side of the graph is really a function of two things. Number one, it's the existing term that the district wants to try to stay within. And number two, it's where are interest rates? Because the interest being thrown off of this debt is really going to dictate how much you know, water finding its own level. What size bucket do you need to put this much water in? And again, hearing the district speak in, in many meetings that this, there may be something in the future that needs addressed that we need to make sure we're thinking ahead. We're, we're forward thinking with our projects. That's why you see that we've always kind of run with it, a, a sloping, a downward sloping, uh, or a tiering process, if you will, at the backside of the debt service. Again, that's looking so that once we see the culmination of all this renovation here at this building, our next project is gonna be right ahead of us. Do we have room in the future to do that? And that's what this structure is allowing for. So that being said, in today's market, could we still adhere to that, fund the full 31 million, and complete it as it sits today? Yes, that page one is showing that. 
And page two is numerically a representation of, of the graph and basically gives a quick summary of what you have uh, in this new issue, 12.360. That would bring your total project borrowing to 31, uh, basically 31 and a half million over three bond issues. And that would fund the $31 million project, uh, you know, net of uh, all other components of the financing. And you can see that going across. You see your existing debt service. You see the estimated series of 2014 debt service, the debt service on a combined basis, uh, the capitalized interest to keep the near-term payments right at where you're at, at the $2.7 million dollar level annually, and then the estimated reimbursement on your existing debt. Now, uh, something to see there is following that is at zero. Uh, maintaining that, we're not sure when the district may see any reimbursement coming out of PDE. Uh, so again, those zeros are there. This is bringing your debt service right to the $2.7 million level uh, going out to complete this project. And then you can, if you look in the last uh, beginning in fiscal 2026, you can see the tiering begin where you go from that $2.7 million level and basically tearing it down at equal amounts, uh, 2.5, 2.3 2.2, 2 million, 1.8, 1.7. You're, you're basically getting a step down, which will again start to create room. If there's a project that may follow, you're now creating space to start filling that in and manage that annual debt service level. Now, flipping to page three. Johnny, before you jump oh, there, sure. help me. Uh, I'm missing something here. Maybe the better Hank can answer the question. The latest numbers we got was a little slightly over 32 million for the uh, total project cost. Why is the uh, estimated net project funds only 31? That was from the last blank on that we had seen that was 30 million dollars difference. Nine. Why is that? I, I don't have. Um, the Sarah members with me right now. I can. I, can I got something here from March the 27th. That, that would be accurate then. What, 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 what's the exact? It is 32 some months. 32 some 194 529. That's right. Okay. There's. So that's why I'm just there. curious why that. Yeah. I thought those numbers should actually be matching on on, on under scenario one. That yeah, ours reflected the last version of the okay, project so that's that the we difference. have seen. That's the difference. So if you yeah. had a new number, this would technically be the same number. They, they will be the same number. Thank yes, you. exactly, exactly. And that's that's reflective. Now, the 32, again, if we flip the, the scenario two, what you'll look at there, basically equating to, uh, you know, another, uh, call it another million dollars in there. Yeah, so, that, so, so the next borrowing amount would technically be 13.4 million. Right, right. And you still, given that difference, as we'll speak here to scenario two, any fluctuation within there is still going to fit, but again, it's a matter of term and how quickly you can start that slope and to what degree you can start that slope at the backside of the debt service. So if you flip to page three, here is a scenario. Again, we still have a range of flexibility based on where rates are today and based on the way the first two issues were structured. Well, let me start by asking you this sure. question. Based on what we just went over, does that mean that these numbers here should also be adjusted by a million dollars? They can be, but this isn't really targeted to a project size. It's rather targeted to extending the term by two years and what can be generated That's by extending so, so, it two years. So if you go back to scenario one, if those numbers are adjusted to uh, 13.4 and $32 million, and then scenario two then would mean we don't have an additional uh, borrowing power going out for 20 years at 1.5 million? Uh, if I'm following the, the exact uh, uh, line. I understand what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's, you're right, yes, that's correct. If, if we need to put another million dollars in, his sample of 2.5 would become 1.5. Right, that's right. Right. You would, you would sop up that extra million in this scenario. So basically you would fall if the base project is now another million dollars <coughs> higher, you're going to fall between yes. scenario one and scenario two. Okay. Uh, scenario two, again, is just an extension of two years, maintaining that same slope. Uh, if you notice, it does extend the plateau where you're at currently in annual debt service of 2.7 million a couple more years, and then start your downward slope to open up the backside of the debt service. 
but we extend the debt to final term out two more years to 2033. And what you can then fit in with those parameters is a total project of 33 and a half, and you would borrow 15.3 million would be this completion borrowing. And again, the scenarios where you can add and subtract is merely an adjustment of how far out that plateau would need to go at 2.7 million before you started to step down, or the how rapid your your backside of the debt service steps down, and that's where there's a little bit of flexibility Sorry, based on what you need. This scenario two is that is that uh, scenario one is that 18 years? Is that 20? 17. Right. Based Sorry, on China. Get some numbers in my head here. Sure, sure. And again, the, the scenario two again is was the only constraint here were uh, I should say the only constraints were the final term extending out two years from where we are today, being 2031, and maintaining that debt service slope in the back end. Those two things can be adjusted based on what the need is. If the, if, if the need is Again, it was how much extra proceeds can be raised by going out those two years. In this scenario, about 2.5 million. Again, if there's another million added to the front side of the project, this, this scenario here would be raising 1.5 million extra. But if we wanted to extend the plateauing to the $2.7 million level out a couple more years and maybe not slope down as quickly in the last four or five years, there may be another million dollars worth of room to fit in there, or right. you know, $750,000 worth of room to fit in there. It's one of those, it's truly based on term and where interest rates sit. Well, Bruce was figuring out, is it safe to say it's one point, roughly $1.2 million a year? That you were picking up by yeah, extending? By, by it, it was pretty safe. I think some of the numbers that, that Brett and I had spoken about at the, at the end of last year, beginning of 2014, <coughs> Every year you go out, it, it, if you roughly judge it, about a million dollars is what you can So the 1.5 is based off of how many years? Uh, well, again, the 1.5, about change two years. Two years with, the with the change in slope. With the change and slight total. change in slope. Yeah. I, I gotcha. That'd be 20 years total. And, and take you to 20 years total. If, you, if, you, if our base year was 2013, your final maturity is going to be 23. Yeah. 17. Right, you're, you're going to be just under that. Right, you can go, you got one more year to play with. Yeah. That's eight, what I'm getting at, yeah. Eight, right, you uh, can play with one more year. I remember from a previous conversation where Nick was talking about the last building project and Plan Con required a 20 year uh, bond. Is Plan that Con does actually none of ours require are a 20 year bond. Plan Con will repay you over 20 years, no faster. That's right. You can always be shorter. <laughs> They just they maximize what they can. Thank you. So, so, so money usually when, when it was a plan con project, schools did a 20-year bond because that's how they were receiving their, their stuff. Chris can add. Because I know that we're doing a 10. And a, Chris can add color there. Yeah, the plan con will At least until they start to change plan con, they'll reimburse you over the life of whatever period of debt you choose. It could be longer than 20. Their 20-year rule says they won't come back and provide reimbursement on a building that you've touched in the last 20 years. In other words, you go into a building and you do something, you come back 10 years later and say, we need to work on this building again. You're shut out, absent some forgiveness or exception or what have you. So 20 year rule not to be, or is more of a do what you need to do and make it work for 20 years. Which is though a good guide for what your debt terms should be. And, and, and they won't pay you back any faster than 20 years, correct? They'll, they'll pay no. their share they'll over the term share. of the debt you choose. Yeah, if you, if you would take these bonds out 30 years, they would pay Wait, back on right. that. So the if out you take the bonds out over 10 years, they right. would they so pay you back over 10 years? Your yes. That's so rather than 10 years and 30 years, you're going to be reimbursed whatever percentage they allow you to have over the, the course of the you know term that you selected. Yeah, but we have three different ones, three different time frames that we're talking about now. So you still get reimbursed on those three different time frames. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and don't pay, it's project based, so yeah. you can borrow in, in tranches for that, but your rate is based on that single project with any financing of that project lumped. They, they'll view it as one. So we're making three payments a year, but they we submit it to them and it's only one. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, they'll, they'll view it as any financing related to project number. Four, six, three, nine. You know, 
just to that's because it's not our, yeah. when we raised the millage back in the 90s, we staggered it for a three-year period, four-year period. That's right. That's why it's like it is right now. So, Brett, though, if PlanCon comes back in, they don't change. So they will, you'll get chunks of money over the 20 years or whatever it is. They're not going to stretch it out based on any kind of term that we did. So, and, and in our case, if and I think I'm right about this. Let's say that we've paid five years of payments. This is where I'm going. So and go ahead. then we're finally approved. They'll cut us a check for those five years. Okay. And then they'll catch up going forward. And that money, we'll if we had budgeted to pay for this without plan con, which is effectively what we're doing. Is what we did, yeah. Right. We put it in, but we're not, you know, it's hopeful money, but it's not right in the budget. So if that money, if plan con comes back, it's approved, money starts coming in. That money could either go, could you accelerate the pay down of this with that money? And or could you take that money into a, a se second project? H how do you justify the use of that fund? Well, I don't know that you can accelerate the payments because the payments are what bonds are. You could establish a fund. Yeah, could you put that to a future right, building project? You could, sure, you do whatever you want with it. It's your you money. Put, you can put right. a general you fund if you want. Your, your no, 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 I'm no I'm Rich. I'm no, no, Rich. I'm just, I'm just making the point that you no. can do whatever you yeah. want with it. No, no, no. No, believe me. Can you do whatever you want with it? I mean, could that money roll into a general fund? Sure, it's really good. Oh, good, so we can do whatever, okay. I'm not saying anything wrong. No, 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 I understand, I understand. No, but I want to drop a couple foot notes on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you got him off, he's up, please do. Yeah, he's up. Yeah, he's up. Yeah, he's up. Yeah, he's up. He's up. No, no, no. <laughs> if PlanCon comes back, and if they follow the pattern they have in the past, Brett's absolutely right, they'll reach back and reimburse you. Okay. And so you could hope for a payday, holiday, I heard that term earlier, of a lot of unpaid PlanCon reimbursement to you, but we don't know. If they change up the program, though, be prepared, because my worry is that they'll go ahead and continue plan con, but do a few other things to it that they haven't done in the past. Right. I guess what I'm trying to get to on the plan con money is we're trying to fund a project without it. So and anything that comes back to us from it in whatever so form is money that we can look at. It, yeah, it's a future building project. It's a whatever. It's a, it's a revenue into the, right. into the okay. budget that That's you right. had not had. Okay. If you go to segregate it, the reason I got to my feet is that <laughs> now we raise some arbitrage issues with right. tax rules, right. okay? Because what the federal government doesn't want to do, have you do is to have a bunch of money in your sure. pocket and yet you borrow it and finance with tax cent rates. Not a worry unless you make money on the money in this market, you can't do that, right. you're investing lower. Right. But I have to warn you against creating some large money generating account for your bonds. In terms of prepay, Bonds have got some restrictions on right, them. Right, right. That's the instruments to find that. Doesn't right. mean we can't one day see a pot of money and a refunding opportunity to work both those in. Right. Okay. The only other thing is that plan con is a pay as you go, and so whenever it's working the way it should, you get a reimbursed percentage. That times your payment, times your aid ratio, you get your check back. You pay, they pay, you pay, they pay. If you accelerate out of your own pocket, you say, we're going to go ahead and make a large payment because we've got the money to do it and the bonds are at a call date, they won't be with you on that. They have in the past sometimes allowed an exception, but they got burned in the 80s when a lot of districts so-called defeats debt by putting up a lot of money to pay off debt and turning around asking for the state share. The state ran themselves dry a couple years. So they'll so continue to fund it, whatever. They'll continue to fund it. Right. But if you do an accelerate exceptional payment, you may or may not see them match that. Right. No, I agree. But so there's well, you will see that. whatever that annual payment is still coming in that you could apply to another project. Okay. That's that's cool. teasers or something right. else. It's just a weird situation <laughs> since the timing is now different than yes. when it was always matched in the past. But I just want to make sure if there are restrictions to that money, we understand what they are. And what our flexibility to and, that and money they're not severe. In. You've got it. That'll be a great day if you can get that money. Yeah. Because right. what's, what's the typical call period on the bonds? Uh, five years. Yeah. Right now, the, the 2012 and 2013, you have five years, uh, and that's when they have uh, bank qualified status that we've spoken of in the past, and, and the, the district has taken advantage of that twice now uh, for lower rates and a shorter call. Uh, once you get above ten million dollars. Now you're a non-bank qualified, and typically investors, when they are, are purchasing bonds without any other uh, exceptions from their side, and they're looking at a little bigger debt and, and bigger portions, 
they want to make sure that their interest rates are protected at least for a longer period. Uh, it's a different type of buyer in the non-bank qualified space than the bank qualified space, and they're going to demand a little longer call. Typically, that's a 10-year call as a standard call for anything over $10 million. So that's where you, and the nuance there is that there may or may not be, depending on the timing, depending on market conditions, a rate benefit there. It's just a different world of buyers at that point. And if a rate benefit does exist, then it behooves you to go after BQ, especially for the five-year call. If you start to see rates slipping away and don't want to take that market risk on, on the remainder, then non-bank qualified to take advantage of where rates are today. And the only hurdle there, is, and it's not truly a hurdle, but you may be looking at a 10-year call on that last piece as opposed to a shorter five-year call. And, and traditionally, on any big building projects for a lot of districts, a lot of them do the wraparounds of their existing debt to keep current millage low. Uh, they see the 10-year call because all the bonds are in the back end. There's no bonds up front. So typically the 10-year call, and there's really no harm, no foul to the district because that 10-year period, there's not a whole lot of bonds maturing there. Most of the bonds are after that point. And just to clarify one thing, if there's like the five, we've been paying five years and then everything works as it used to and there's this five-year payment, you can hold that money. You just can't have an arbitrage issue. So if you have your strategy keeps up below your borrowing rate or at your fund, right? So yeah, if the money comes in in your general funds, it's a receipt. You can have it. You can keep it. What you can't do is take it and get it dedicated to debt and invest it in a higher yield. Right. <clears throat> you can't pledge it, create it into a pledged fund. It yeah. just raises the auditors interest. left too soon. They could. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that rule has been a very annoying rule over the years. Uh, but it's because, again, there were some devices, some financing devices in the late 70s that were, I always like to say, the dark side of the force. The, sort of the other side of arbitrage was investing of your own money, pledged against debt, and if we just got a bevy of rules out of the IRS, then to stop that. So. It, could be, it could be utilized as a capital reserve account. It could be right. utilized just as an offset to your budgeting. It can be utilized as an early repayment fund, so to speak. But it just can't be triggered or targeted to any one issue because now you're talking about yield restriction to that allowable bond yield. Uh, but it could be, let's say, uh, in five years' time, rates are such that the 2012 2013 issues can be refinanced for savings for the district, or you just want to take advantage of paying down a little bit of the debt that's outstanding at the call date. You can now take that money apply it to redemption of outstanding bonds, whether it be on their own or part of a, an overall refinancing, and, and that would be an eligible use of that one. Hank, remind me, what historically has been the percentage reimbursement? Roughly, it, that, yeah, it's just a hard number to hit, but roughly about 30%, and that's not off of the 30. 32 million project, that's, that's off of hard your, cost. That's off hard cost. Hard cost okay. 26. So 26 million, mm -hmm. so okay. Still a lot of money. Mm -hmm. If I yeah, so read the plan con documents correctly, I think they were estimating it to be 25% of this project. Okay. The last one was 30% right there. Well, the last one was 40 to 30 So it was like 25% of 26 million? Yeah. That was seven. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 If I read it right. Okay. I just I just got it today and I went through it really quick. But Maybe I, send those to Tony and I. I will. I'll give them to you tomorrow. Your project reimbursement is always going to be factored times your market value aid ratio. So if you're looking at 25% of the project, you're not going to get 20 cents a dollar. We get 60% of 25%. Very well. No, unfortunately, it's, it's not uncommon. It's, okay. it's not bad, actually. Um, problem with PlanCon is that it, so much of it keys off of a per student dollar amount okay. that's in the school code and hasn't been revised for 20 years. Okay. Maybe not that long, but for a while. So that's a straight 15%. 60%, yeah. 25, so it's straight 15. Okay. So you're still looking at 2.6, 1.3, $4 million. Yeah. That's your yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's that's tangible. Yeah, yeah. certainly. Is. It's an interesting education. It is. Okay. Anything else for Chris? Thank you, gentlemen. Tony? Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you very Good much to see you all.
Yeah, in your packet, you should have received, uh, you've, you've seen this before, but I'm not sure that we update the, uh, the order. Uh, I think in February, we uh, asked the board to, to rank everything one final time, and the total uh, ad alternate summary is still just under $5 million. Uh, the order of the preferences uh, for the summaries, uh, ad alternate is uh, the high school. High school annex is still the, the number one. Number two is the stadium res the restrooms. Number three, replacing the boilers. Number four, the new baseball parking site lighting. Number five, the additional tennis courts and parking associated with it. And the last uh, item is the library skylight. And you can see the dollar figures associated with that. And this is all contingent upon um, $32 million being um, less than that. Um, Ms. Sarah is telling us it can be anywhere typically between you know, eight, nine percent is, is about an average of, of our project coming under the, the 30, well, with 32 million with, with hard and soft costs, but the project is 26 million with uh, hard costs alone. So about eight to nine percent less than that is, is an estimate that, that, that they've been coming at. It's going to hopefully come in about two million dollars less than that. Then the board has to decide based on a presentation uh, today if you want to extend the loan out uh, beyond the 17 years to uh, give us any of these ad alternates. Anybody have any questions about the uh, priorities or the costs associated with them? I do. I thought this, we had eliminated skylight. That's what I was just going to ask. It's ugly. Well, it's number six. Oh, it's, so it's still last. And it's last. last. How about least? Well, I guess not forgotten. <laughs> you can cut I thought it was gone. Uh, oh, since I was holding on to it. Yeah. You, you, you must uh, like that skylight. It's got stadium record. Is there anything about those um, if they're not in the original scope? that makes it difficult to do them later, excavating or plan changes or... And can you answer that for Mr. Noel? Um, off of the top of my head? Yeah, that's... Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> I don't see anything that would jump out that would, that would make them hard to do later. Okay. Uh, and the reason I ask that question is, obviously, if we get the 8% and we're willing to go a year, it's still a very tight fit for some or all these things. So I'm still trying in my mind to figure out, okay, what could be done in a later date out of general operating dollars, especially as we start to see maybe some repair and maintenance go down and things like that. And <coughs> so if there's something that can't be done, I'd like to know that because it may impact how yeah, I look yeah, at it. They are, they are away from everything else on the project okay. and they're, they're kind of a standalone with a grading aspect, so you're not needing dirt from somewhere else to do okay. those or needing dirt from there to go somewhere else. The only thing, the, the only thing that, that it would affect is the possibility, and it's only a possibility of an economy of scale pricing type of thing. Okay. You're rolling that into sure. a big project. Right, you're bringing you may stuff back in. get a better price or you may not. Right. It's just Something else to consider, Bruce, all of these like figures, the same thing applies. Hopefully yeah. they come at 8% No, agreed, well. agreed. I mean, but I look at them, like, obviously, number one, you're not going to go back and do that. Right. <laughs> you, it, it, it's, it's in or out. Where yeah. I look at the other things and say, okay, if we had this pick, and, but if there was something on here that Hank said, oh, no, if you don't do this in the original scope, yeah. it's going to be very difficult. No, Hank, right everything on the add-ons you said, if PlanCon does come back, is reimbursable. It all, that's, that's again, another, it, it's, it's, it's shaky math because there, <laughs> there's, PlanCon reimburses on a percentage of, 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 of a number based on the amount of enrollment, and it, it doesn't yeah, matter correct. whether you're whether correct. you're doing this, that, or the other thing. It, it's so your percentage of reimbursement will look like it's going up or down, somewhat depending but on. These are reimbursement items, though, according to the plan card, what you're saying. Like the cost of going down, right? When rolled into a, an original project, for the most part, they are the standalone toilet building is going to be a gray area. So if it was rolled in before, you have more chance of reimbursement. Right, but it's not going to increase your, your total reimbursable dollars you're, you're because you're going to be capped out with your You're going to be so many dollars per student per, right, right. per enrollment. Right. right. What they call but if we do it on our own, there's no reimbursement. We do it just from our own fund balance. There'll be no reimbursement. The project is large enough that you will get the total amount of reimbursement you're eligible to with or without that. I'm just trying to say we did it isolated like we did the gym. We refurbished the gym ourselves. It, it was no right, kind of right. If you if you isolate a project at a later date, that then you then you get into the into the twenty year right. rule that it's, that it's plan con deals with. Okay. 
just to remind you, the opening is June 12th, and we're going to have a special board action meeting on June 19th to award the bids. So the June 9th meeting is actually going to be June 19th, and we will start advertising that now and on the calendar um, just to coordinate what's happening with our bid openings. And besides that, I only have one other thing um, I want to mention. Can I, can I just go ahead, Scott? The decision with regards to taking it from 17 to 19 needs to be made at what meeting? If our bid is opening by June 12th. So June 12th, you got the number. No, no. I, I, what I'm saying now is if the bond is a favorable market now, I'm just asking a question. Can you give me teed up? Follow the bid opening and the to come behind the bid opening by a couple of weeks. So the we risk of interest wanna, rates. We don't right, want to right. borrow the money beforehand and then find that we don't have enough. Yep. Especially a little bit short. Right. Correct. Because then you got all the costs. Right. The exactly. Rate. But we don't end. Unfortunately, we, we can't anticipate it until June 12th until we actually see the bid opening. June 12th is the thing with the scheduled bid opening, so that's that's the earliest you would you would at least know all the numbers. That doesn't even know what you're supposed to award. You know all the numbers. Scott, I think the answer to your question is the June 19th meeting. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So that's, I think, the answer to the question because we don't meet in July unless we call another special meeting. And contractors have 48 hours from the time they bid to pull their bids due to mathematical errors or some other so thing. So you truly have to wait 48 hours after the bid opening to really know who the low bid, what the low bid numbers are. Now you have, you have plenty of cash to award your bids to right. start. Okay. The only thing you have look at is interest rate risk, which I respect. You may want to consider making the, uh, the second meeting the last Monday of the month. Give yourself more time. Dr. Harris has a conflict with that. Yeah, I'm actually off. Right. We'll and the, 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 farther, the, the farther you push yeah, that out, the, the farther you're pushing yeah. out. It's not going to be the administration's issue. It's going to be our issue. Well, we're going to know the numbers by then. You right. Could, you could schedule both meetings and cancel one. That way you have them advertised and they're out there. That's true. Um, no problem with that. By Thursday? Where are we having? Who knows the numbers by Thursday? You push it back, you push back the construction as well. Right. Well, we don't want to do that. And release the bond. Yeah. I mean, it may be a robust meeting, but certainly if we have the numbers, I don't know why a decision can't be made on the 19th. <coughs> yeah, because what's, what's in it two more days going to get you? Right. Right, that's what I agree. You've been debating how long now. Yeah. More phone calls. And we have our, <laughs> I mean, we do have our order. We've talked about it. We looked at it. We have everything ready to go. It's, again, we're waiting for that bid opening to see how much money it comes from short and how much more we want to do. I mean, we can even bring this up next week as well and have more discussion. About it too. Do we actually want to oh, we got move our plan? Mm -hmm. So, Hank, if I heard you correct, they have 48 hours after they submit it, so they would have somewhere around the 16th, or would they that carry into the weekend? It carries into the weekend. So, you'd know before that. So, so we'll have the numbers by the 16th. Yeah. Plenty of time to, plenty of time to steal Okay. And you guys will be ready to tee up on the 19th then, right? I mean, it makes sense. This is really, it's how many years it's going on. It's got to go. It's just a matter of how many years. Right? Right? Yeah, but... Well, I, I agree, Tony. I think the board, you know, has expressed concern that we're not going to have any room to do some of the other things that need to be done in the district. So, in my opinion, based on that school of thought, which is a good one, that tiering is an important uh, way to go. Right. Does anyone else have any questions for the bond discussion? Um, before we go back to the regular meeting in this information session, if you have not had a chance to see Shrek, please go see it this weekend. You will be, it is an outstanding show. It is amazing. The sets are wonderful. The acting is amazing. The singing is amazing. The dancing, the costumes. You would surely be missing something if you do not go see it. So 
So I encourage everyone, and tickets may be sold out. So please call tomorrow if you still want to see tickets, if you still need it. The show is amazing. It is outstanding. Unbelievable. So I just have to encourage you, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, please see the PT Drama Guild website. It's amazing. <coughs> you won't be sorry. All right. Any other matters before the board? <laughs> And it was a long information session, I guess I, about almost two hours. Next week, we're gonna ask under athletics and extracurricular to approve a volunteer coach. Budget and finance, approve expenditures related to high school renovations for the month of March. Award the IU7 bid. Approve the audited financial statements and signal audit, single audit for 2012-2013. Um, approve the resolution for 20 year variance request. Authorize access architect architecture to submit plan con part f documents to pd for the renovation project we won't have anything reported under building grounds and safeties employee relations negotiations and transportations under food service we are opening the bids tomorrow at 10 o'clock so we will have more information for you next week based on the bid opening so that is tomorrow at 10 o'clock if anyone is interested personnel and curriculum approved substitute teachers and support personnel Authorize Act 80 Day for 2014-2015, accept resignation. Under Policy Public Relations, Legislative Title II, accept and file information committee meeting minutes of March 3rd, 2014. Under Taxes Insurance Consensus, consensus this is where we're talking about the learner to approve ordinance regarding tax assumption for improvements to a new construction of industrial commercial properties in designated areas of Penn Township. I'll turn it over to Tony. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, it is now time for audience recognition. The following rules are in effect. You must state your name, address, and group affiliation, if any. Your statement will be limited to five minutes in duration. All statements shall be directed to the president, and no participant may address or question a board member individually. I may interrupt your statement if your statement is too lengthy, personally direct, abusive, obscene, irrelevant. I have a list of residents who wish to address the board. Your name will be called in the order in which you signed up. There will be no additional sign-ups at this time. Okay. Sally Bradley. Okay, thanks. Um, 847 State Route 130 in Level Green. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Mr. Inglis for being appointed as Assistant Superintendent. And secondly, I don't know if the group if there's anybody else here from Trafford Library. Obviously, the most important library to me is Penn Area where I'm involved. But I also do use the library at Trafford. And I'm not sure any of their numbers or people that come up with people that use it really show an ad accurate amount. Because I'm sure I'm not the only one from Level Green who finds it convenient to sometimes go in there rather than out to Harrison City. So I do hope that we keep that in mind because Level Green, I'm sure, uses mostly Penn Area, but I know they also use Trafford Library, because I do. So thank you. Thank you. I, I'd like to respond to that, because I got a letter from, uh, two letters really, Mrs. Peacock, and uh, you want to speak or you want me to speak? Uh, I think he you signed up next. Yes, I did, but... No, go ahead. I'll let you... I'll, I'll let you... Matthew signed up next. <laughs> okay, good. I'm sorry. No, okay. I'll to that. Matt? Sorry. Right. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Matt Bauman, uh, 868 Street, track of PA. Um, I actually just got those letters that uh, uh, Sharon received from uh, Nancy Gresco uh, stating that about the numbers. I made up some copies if you guys would like to, to have those. And, and, uh, look at them. So I didn't know what you you were going to say, right, Nick, but right. I was just just speaking on behalf. I am the a board member for the Trafford Library, so I was just coming in to represent. And uh, I know uh, Dr. Trey had came and spoke with us back in December um, about some of the figures and uh, you know how the money was going to be redistributed. Uh, to Trafford and I know that it was going to be uh, in consideration of, of giving manor money as well and that's basically what what I was here to find out about what was your reasoning behind 
um, the distribution of, of funds from Trafford to to Manor. That's basically. No, okay. I, um, I did a little bit more and and uh, Miss Peacock, the letter stating that um, the people from the Penary Library said that uh, the student enrollment for Trafford Library is 15. I don't know where that 15 came from. We have our elementary school alone. We have almost 200 kids, and so that's not counting the uh, preschoolers. Uh, and that number is so so far off. It's um, it's not even close. I mean, there's 15 kids living in my neighborhood that go to uh, Trafford Elementary School, and they're concerned about a reduction in the reimbursement from the school district. That's their big concern. And I relayed all this message to. Uh, we have so much going on in school district now, but the I got late Friday afternoon to Dr. Harris, and I told him, I says, you know, that there's a concern here, and I gave him all the names and the email address, et cetera. And what Mrs. Bradley did say, and I, um, I'm president of the Trafford Rec Board, and every last Monday we have our meeting right there at, uh, in the borough, new borough building, and, and, and once in a while I'll stop in, and um, there are many people from Lower Green use Trafford Library. I mean, there's a and also Pickhairn, and also Cavusville, and also Ardera. I mean, it's a, it's a draw, and it's, um, it's pretty well used. But to reduce their reimbursement on, uh, on those numbers from Penn Area Library, I think there's more people from Lower Green go to Trafford Library than do out the Penn Area Library. But yeah, that's just uh, what I've been told. So, but to, to decrease their reimbursement would be unfair. That's just uh, that should be the wrong thing to do. And I wanted to express that. Okay, thank uh, you for coming. I think it's probably we should start the goal in this process uh, to offer something as far as data that may have forgotten one stage or another. But we haven't talked about this issue in a board meeting for probably eight or nine months. And at that time, we drew data, which I shared at that time with everybody in the group, yourself included, Mr. Tracy, that uh, we had one, we had to come up with a consistent source of information to provide a juvenile registration. Because at the time we left this, six or seven months ago was based upon a figure below 18 year olds are below signed up. We had to come up with one uniform source. The one uniform source was used both by Trafford, Manor, and by Penn Area. So we had the data researched. It was collected for me at that particular time by the uh, six or seven or eight months back by the Penn Area librarian at that time. It was all from the same source. The person cited, I shared all that data with you. It showed a disparity based upon the data we used, which was juvenile registration and uh, disparity was significant at that time. There's still a significant disparity between what is used in Penn Area. I mean, if this is valid data too, uh, and it's not been updated for six or 10, ten months, but uh, that's just where you are at this yeah, particular stage. Yeah, I, we, Everybody we, fights over numbers. It's all how yeah, you want to interpret it. When, when, we did, when we, we did discuss this, and I do understand, the number 15 never came up. I mean, I, I mean that is just absurd. Now, as all I can tell you is we got it from the same data source on a regional level that, that records it for both Trafford, for Manor, and also for and also for Penn Area. It's the same. They draw the same data from the same reported information that came from all three libraries. So that's all we could do at that time. Again, we've not discussed this in a public meeting, and we weren't really going to do that until as we get closer to the main time. Okay, I, I could, yeah. But what we want to do is we wanted to be fair. And that's the most important well, thing. We exactly want to ensure right. that we assign things on a proportionate level, at whatever they might be. And if Penn Area Library has 2,000 students enrolled, and Trafford has 250, and Manor has 150, well, you know, that's fair. That's a fair. Yeah, that, that, that is. That's number 15. Was uh, that this is came from Nancy uh, Gresco, executive director of the West Warren County Federated Library System. So. I think it's a very good source. Mm -hmm. And should be a good source to, to update the data that we'll need for the Penn area and also for Manor to do a, a fair decision. And thank you for coming. Oh, hey, thank I'll you. Say something else with your number. Sure. Um, where the discrepancy is probably coming from, you get one library card that's good, I think, in every library in West Morton County. So you may have gotten, or you may get your library card from Penn area. But that might be the only time somebody goes in there or goes to Manor. You know, it's like, who's, where are you using the library card? If I take something out of Penn Area Library, it's my Penn Area Library card. If I go through Westmoreland um, Library Association, if I go to Trafford, it's still my Penn Area Library card. 
It's, you know, the card says Westmoreland Intermediate or Westmoreland Library something. Oh. So, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's where you got your library card, which may be where you use it or where you don't. I mean, I know I go into Penn Area Library much more, but I do go into Trafford. So, I can see why the number got yeah. distorted. Yeah. So, Matt, just for the rest of us who aren't knee deep in this, how are we going to get the numbers that are, where can we pull that source so that Sally's comments are addressed, Nick's, and some of the other folks have come here today, so we are evenly distributing. And we're, I think we're talking about $14,000, correct? Yeah, I think they sent me all the data on Friday. He gave me an email on Friday, but I already said because the agenda was so, as you see, it's nice. It's already been two hours. We have a long agenda. I said, let's just wait till next week, and I was going to just get you all this information. But, okay. but, but where we will are we pulling find, the numbers from, then, I guess, is the question. We will find the correct numbers and the source. We well, should do it coming from this source. This is right. the source that maintains all the data. That's true. The West Moreland region. That's true. The same original source that we addressed nine months ago, but obviously there's a disparity. Are we able to contact We're only talking about Nancy registration, Gretzky. not kids in the school system or anything else. How many kids were registered by their families assigned to a particular library? And the data that they agreed to set up from the well, regional level. Give us accurate data that we'll have Oh, we have to update. We have to. This is the only. I mean, if they can't give us accurate data based on what Sally said, then we're going to have to find another way to do it. Right. Because well, if they live in Trafford, but they may have signed up out of Penn because they were there one day, I, I don't know that to be true. Well, I, I, there, is a, there is a gray area, as there is the gray areas in just testifying any numbers for any participation, any activity. It's the same thing we're seeing with PTARC or, or any other recreation participation <laughs> uses a playground. <laughs> <laughs> well, population numbers. I'm just telling. I'm just saying. Just just an example. Yeah, just just saying. Just yeah. 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 yeah, you can have kids. I understand what you're saying. It is hard to. No, we have. As long as you use the same system, even though it will be a gray area to some extent, it'll be provided by one source. So they'll be interpreting our data exactly. And I, it, I agree that it has to be from the West Moreland County Library System because they provided the first data to us. That was given to me about. Uh, yeah, that's what, that's what we based this whole thing on, and we had we had addressed this for eight, seven, or eight months. So we look at it and see the facts of common sense. Like, like Nick said, 15 should have jumped out. Yeah. Uh, it was zip codes work though? I'm just talking to Dallas. He said there's nine in the nine in the district. Yeah. Or so nine it's just true. in Penn Township. But I'm saying that. Like, right. Maybe just maybe zip codes is what separates. And that's what they were trying to break down. They're trying to break it down by zip codes, assign it to libraries within wow. that system. And that's how it was based on. I don't know how it was defined for me. That was a report yeah. I got from this this source but that identified it accordingly. And it had a great disparity. It didn't have that. that it didn't have that split. Remember, Manor wasn't in the equation either. You got Manor, Manor, Manor got nothing. A lot of Manor's in Hemphill. Right. But now, the Manor's we, we, Manor has already been excluded. It was only the, the the only part that was identified was the district. Our district part of that. We got that part narrowed out apparently large part, large part of from this organization at the beginning. Right. A large part's in Penn Trafford, parts in Hempfield, mm -hmm. and some little bits in Norwood. Yeah. Right. Just saying, but a large so majority and you have probably three zip codes overlapped in Manor. They, they go by zip codes all level for your Traffords. Zip, zip codes are really difficult yeah. to deal with because the postal system They're doesn't care about school Manor district road or it's geographic boundaries. Right. 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 It's, it's a lot of people. Yeah. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take everything that Nick sent me, make sure everyone has it, and I'll also contact, and I'll talk to Jay, and I'll also contact Nancy. Yeah, they, they just, I spent a lot of time trying to come up with some type of a standard plan to do this equitably, and also to, to take time to alert our libraries we need to recruit kids. We need to make an address addressing the students. And they've done a fantastic job of trying to do that. They've been coming into the schools, building their presence more, working on that. That in alone has drawn a lot of a lot of enthusiasm and focus back to the schools. That's one key point. Now the question is, we got fourteen thousand dollars, we don't increase it. How do we distribute distribute equally among the students? Yeah, fourteen thousand dollars. How do we do it? It's nine to pen right now, five to traffic. Uh, but just think about it. If, not, if traffic, if Penn comes back and the same report says I only got five thousand dollars assigned, five uh, two thousand students assigned, traffic's got two fifty. Yeah. 
Is that a $9,000, $5,000 split? And what do we give Manor? You know, Manor was down in the same level with Trapper. Maybe they'll come up with 250 kids too. I don't know. I hope they do. I hope there are that many kids. I hope they're going, they're reading. We'll find out. It'll be fair. But we'll here. be you perfect. Do yeah. your homework, Doctor. Get back to this next week. One other suggestion. Could you have people sign in the library when they go into it and you know who's going in and where they live? Kid, we're talking kid. Now well, our yeah, focus is kids. Whatever, kids so, or talking, whoever you yeah. identify. That was clear from the beginning. We're looking at students. Juveniles versus students. I'll make sure you have all the information and next week I'll talk about this again. I think we already had the meeting kind of long enough tonight. Alright, do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. You have something to say? No, no, you just, no, you're making the motion. Make the motion. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this meeting is adjourned at 9, 10, 2 hours. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you.